Yes, yes. You know where the bathroom is. The ladies are here, so you might have to go this way. Yeah. You might have to go in the interior or something. The ladies are here.
be sending me a seat portion. Oh. Although I am getting old here, I'd like to feel younger when I sit on the floor. I figured like a minimum of four days. Oh, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله ملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا سين والقرآن الحكيم إنك لمن المرسلين على صراط مستقيم تنزيل العزيز الرحيم لتنذر قوما ما أنذر آباؤهم فهم غافلون لقد حق القول على أكثرهم فهم لا يؤمنون إنا جعلنا في أعناقهم أغلالا فهي إلى الأذقان فهم مقمحون وجعلنا من بين أيديهم سدا ومن خلفهم سدا فأغشيناهم فهم لا ينبسرون وسواء عليهم أنذرتهم أم لم تنذرهم لا يؤمنون إنما تنذر من اتبع الذكر وخشي الرحمن بالغيب فبشره بمغفرة وأجر كريم 
انا نحن نحيي الموتى ونكتب ما قندب ما ثارهم وكل شيء احصيناه في ما من مبين واضرب لهم مثلا اصحاب القرية جاء المرسلون إذ أرسلنا إليهم اثنين فكذبوهما فعززنا بثالث فقالوا فقالوا إنا إليكم مرسلون قالوا ما أنتم إلا بشر مثلنا وما أنزل الرحمن من شيء إن أنتم إلا تكذبون قالوا ربنا يعلم إنا إليكم لمرسلون وما علينا إلا البلاغ المبين قالوا إنا تطيرنا بكم لئن لم تنتهوا لنرجمنكم ولا مسنكم منا عذاب أليم قالوا طائركم معكم أئن ذكرتم بل أنتم قوم مسرفون وجاء من أقصى المدينة رجل يسعى قال يا قوم اتبعوا المرسلين اتبعوا من لا يسألكم أجرا وهم مهتدون وما لي لا أعبد الذي فترني وإليه ترجعون أتخذ من دونها لها يردني الرحمن بدر لا تغني عني شفاعتهم شيئا ولا ينقذون إني إذا لفي ضلال مبين إني آمنت بربكم فاسمعون قيل ادخل الجنة قال يا ليت قوم يعلمون بما غفر لي ربي وجعلني من المكرمين وما أنزلنا على قومه من بعده من جند من السماء وما كنا منزلين إن كانت إلا سويحة واحدة فإذا هم خامدون يا حسرة على العباد ما يأتيهم من رسول إلا كانوا به يستهزئون ألم يروا كم أهلكنا قبلهم من القرون أنهم إليهم لا يرجعون وإن كل لما جميع لدينا محضرون وآية لهم الأرض الميتة أحييناها وأخرجنا منها هبا فمنه يأكلون وجعلنا فيها جنات من نخيل وأعناب وفجرنا فيها من العيون ليأكلوا من ثمره وما عملته أيديهم أفلا يشكرون سبحان الذي خلق الأزواج كلها مما تنبت الأرض ومن أنفسهم ومما لا يعلمون وآية لهم الليل نسخ منه النهار فإذا, فإذا هم مظلمون والشمس تجري لمستقر لها ذلك تقدير عزيز العليم والقمر قدرناه منازل حتى طاعة كالمرجون القديم لا شمس ينبغي لها أن تدرك القمر ولا الليل سابق النهار وكل في فلك يسبحون وآية لهم أنا حملنا ذريتهم في الفلك المشحون وخلقنا لهم من مثل ما يركبون وإن نشا نغرقهم فلا صريخ لهم ولا هم ينقذون إلا رحمة منا ومتاعا إلى حين وإذا قيل لهم اتقوا ما بين أيديكم وما خلفكم لعلكم ترحمون وما تأتيهم من آية من آيات ربهم إلا كانوا عنها معرضين وإذا قيل لهم أنفقوا مما رزقكم الله قال الذين كفروا للذين آمنوا أن أطعموا من لو يشاء الله أطعمه إن أنتم إلا في ضلال مبين 
وَيَقُولُونَ مَتَى هَذَا الْوَعْدُ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ مَا يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَّا صَيْحَةً وَاحِدَةً تَأْخُذُهُمْ وَهُمْ يَخِرْسِمُونَ فَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ تَوْسِيَةً وَلَا إِلَى أَهْلِهِمْ يَرْجِعُونَ وَنُفِخَ فِي السُّورِ فَإِذَا هُمْ مِنَ الْأَجْدَاثِ إِلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَنْسِلُونَ قَالُوا يَا وَيْلَنَا مَنْ بَعَثَنَا مِنْ مَرْقَدِنَا هذا ما وعد الرحمن وصدق المرسلون ان كانت الا صيحه واحده فاذا هم جميع لدينا محضرون فاليوم لا تظلم نفس شيئا ولا تجزون الا ما كنتم تعملون ان اصحاب الجنه اليوم في شغل فاكهون هم وازواجهم في ظلال على الارائك متكئون لهم فيها فاكهه ولهم ما يدعون سلام قولا من رب بالرحيم وامتاز اليوم ايها المجرمون الم احد اليكم يا بني ادم ان لا تعبدوا الشيطان انه لكم عدو مبين وان اعبدوني هذا صراط مستقيم ولقد اضل منكم جبلا كثيرا افلن تكونوا تاخلون هذه جهنم التي كنتم توعدون اسلوها اليوم بما كنتم تكفرون اليوم نختم على افواههم وتكلمنا ايديهم وتشهد ارجلهم بما كانوا يكسبون ولو نشاء لطمسنا على اعينهم فاستبقوا الصراط فانا يمسرون ولو نشاء لمسخناهم على مكانتهم فما استطاعوا مديا ولا يرجعون ومن نعمله ننكس في الخلق افلا يعقلون وما علمناه الشعر وما ينبغي له ان هو الا ذكر وقران مبين لينذر من كان حيا ويحق القول على الكافرين اولم يروا ان خلقنا لهم مما عملت ايدينا انعاما فهم لها مالكون وذللناها لهم فمنها ركوبهم ومنها ياكلون ولهم فيها منافع ومشارب افلا يشكرون واتخذوا من دون الله الهه لعلهم ينسرون لا يستطيعون نسرهم وهم لهم جند محضرون فلا يحزن قولهم ان نعلم ما يسرون وما يعلنون اولم يروا اولم اولم يرى الانسان ان خلقناه من نطفه فاذا هو خصيم مبين وضرب لنا مثلا ونسي خلقه قال من يحيي العظام وهي رميم قل يحييها الذي انشاها اول مره وهو بكل خلق عليم الذي جعل لكم من الشجر الاخضر نارا فاذا انتم منه توقدون اوليس الذي خلق السماوات والارض بقادر على ان يخلق مثلهم بلى وهو الخلاق العليم انما امره اذا اراد شيئا ان يقول له كن فيكون فسبحان الذي بيده ملكوت كل شيء واليه ترجعون سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين صدق الله العلي العظيم الفاتحه و...
حدیث قصہ اللہ صلی علی محمد علی محمد بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ان فاطمہ الزہرا علیہ السلام بنت رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ و علیہ ان قال دخل علی ابی رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ و علیہ فی بعض الایام فقال السلام علیک یا فاطمہ تو فقول تو علیک السلام قال ان اجد فی بدنی ضعفا فقول تو له عید بالله یا بتاؤ من الزعف فقال یا فاطمہ تو اتنی ملک سال یمانی فغتینی بھی فاتح تو بلکہ سال یمانی فقط تی تو بھی وسیع تو انظر علیہ و عزا و جتلا لو کان البدر فی لیلتی تمامی و کمالی فما کانت اللہ ساعت و عزا بی ولد الحسن علیہ السلام قد اقبل و قال السلام علیکی یا امہ فقلت علیک السلام یا قرت عینی و سمت فوادی فقال یا امہ انی شمندکی رائیتا تیبا کانا رائیتو جدی رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وآلہ فقلت نعم انہ جدکا تحت الکساء فاقبل لس نحو الکساء وقال السلام علیک یا جدہو یا رسول اللہ اتا ازمین ادخنا ما اکا تحت الکساء فقال والیک السلام یا ولدی و یا صاحب حوزی قد ازین تولک فدخل معه تحت الکساء فما كانت الا ساعة وإزاء بولد الحسين عليه السلام قد أقبل وقال السلام عليك يا أما فقلت عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا قرة عيني وثمنة فوادي فقال لي يا أمه إن شمنك راية طيبة كأن راية جد رسول الله فقلت نعم إن جدك وخاك تحت الكساء فدن الحسين نحو الكساء وقال السلام علیک یا جدہ و السلام علیک یا من اختار اللہ آتا ذنکون ما کما تحت الکساء فقال والیک السلام یا ولد یا شاف امتی قد ازین تولک فدخل ما هما تحت الکساء وقبل عند ذالك ابو الحسن علی ابن عبی طالب علیہ السلام وقال السلام علیک یا بنت رسول اللہ فقلت علیک السلام یا ابو الحسن و یا امیر المؤمنین فقال یا فاطمہ تو انہی شمندکی رائیتا تیبا کانا رائیت اخی اپنی عمی رسول اللہ فقلت نعام ہا ہوا ما ولدیک تحت الکساء فاقبال عالی علیہ السلام نحو الکساء وقال السلام علیکہ یا رسول اللہ اتا ازن نکون ما کم تحت الکساء فقال والیکہ السلام یا اخی و یا وسیعی و خلیفتی و صاحب لیوائک دسیند اللہ فَدَخَلَ عَلِيٌّ تَحْتَ الْكِسَى ثُمَّ آتَيْتُ نَحْوَ الْكِسَى وَقُلْتُ السَّلَامُ عَلَيْكَ يَا أَبَتَعُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَتَعْذُنْ لَكُونَ مَا كُمْ تَحْتَ الْكِسَى فَكَالَ وَالِكِ السَّلَامِ يَا بِنْتِ وَيَا بِزْعَتِ كَتَزِنْتُ لَكْ فَدَخَلْتُ تَحْتَ الْكِسَى فَلَمَّ وقال اللهم إن هؤلاء أهل بيتي وخاستي وحامتي لحمهم لحمي ودمهم دمي يؤلمني ما يؤلمهم ويحزنني ما يحزنهم أنا حرب لمن حاربهم وسلم لمن سالمهم وعدو لمن آداهم ومحب لمن أحبهم إنهم مني وأنا منهم فاجعل سلواتك وبركاتك ورحمة غفرانك ورزوانك عليا وعليهم آزب آنهم رجسا وآنهم رجسا وطاهرهم تطهيرا فقال الله عز وجل يا ملائكة يا سكان سماواتي إني ما خلقت سماء مبنيا ولا أرض مدحيا ولا كمرا منيرا ولا شمسا مذيئا ولا فلكا يدور ولا بحن يجل ولا فلكا يسري إلا في محبتي هؤلاء الخمسة الذين هم تحت الكساء فقال من جبرائيل يا ربي من تحت الكساء فقال أز وجل وما أهل بيت النبوة وما عدن الرسالة هم فاتمة وأبوها وبعلها وبنوها فقال جبرائيل يا ربي أتاس لأحبد الأرز لكون معهم سادسا فقال لو نعم قد زينت لك فابت الأمين جبرائيل وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله 
ان علينا على يكرك السلام ويخصك بالتية والإكرام ويكون لك ويزة وجلالي إني ما خلقت سماء مبنية ولا أرز مدحية ولا قمر منير ولا شمس مذيئة ولا فلك يدور ولا بحر يجلى ولا بحر يجلى ولا فلك يسري إلا لأجلكم محبتكم وقد أزن لي وقد أزن لي أن تقول معكم فلت أزن لي يا رسول الله فقال رسول الله وعليك السلام يا أمين وحي الله إنه نعم قد أزنت لك فدخل جبرائيل معنا تحت الكساء فقال لي أبي إن الله قد أوحى إليكم يقول إنما يريد الله يذب عنكم أنكم رد سهل البيت ويتهركم تطهيرا فقال عالي الإسلام لي أبي يا رسول الله أخبرني ما لجلوسنا هذا تحت الكساء من الفضل عند الله فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وآله والذي بعث من الحق نبيا واستفاني بالرسالة النجية ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في محفل في محفل منها في أهل الأرض وفي جمع من شيعتنا محبين إلا ونزلت عليهم الرحمة وعفت به الملائكة استغفرت لهم إلى أن يتفرقوا فقال عائل عليه السلام إذا ولا يفوزنا فاز شيئتنا ورب الكعبة فقال أبي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله يا علي والذي بعث من الحق نبيا واستفاني بالرسالة نجيا ما ذكرنا خبرنا هذا في محفل في محفل من محافل أهل الأرض وفي جمع من شيعتنا محبين وفي محموم إلا وفرج الله هما ولا مغموم إلا كشف الله غما ولا طالب حاجة إلا كذا الله حاجة فقال عائلي السلام إذا والله فزنا وسعدنا كذلك شيعتنا فازوا وسعدوا في الدنيا والآخرة رب الكعبة پر محمد و آل محمد سلوات سجاد غریب غربا آیا ہے بابا سجاد غریب غربا آیا ہے بابا کیا عرض کروں سا تھ زباہی نہیں دیتی کیا عرض کروں سا تھ زباہی نہیں دیتی میں نے تیرا لاشا بھی نہ دف نایا ہے بابا سجاد غریب غربا آیا ہے بابا یہ اجرا ہوا کا فیلا آیا ہے پلٹ کر یہ اجرا ہوا کا فیلا آیا ہے پلٹ کر بیٹا تیرا عشقوں کا کفن لایا ہے بابا سجاد غریب غربا آیا ہے بابا بے مکنا چادر تھی پھوپی مجمائے کف بے مکنا چادر تھی پھوپی مجمائے کفار اس حال نے کیا کیا مجھے رل وایا ہے بابا سجاد غریب 
गुरबा आया है बाबा जिंदा में सकीना की लहद मैंने बनाई जिंदा में सकीना की लहद मैंने बनाई सजाद अमानत तेरी छोरा है बाबा सजाद गरीबुल गुरबा आया है बाबा जंजीर थी हाथों में मेरे तो गले में जंजीर थी हाथों में मेरे तो गले में एक फल भी सुकू में नहीं पाया है बाबा सजाद गरीबुल गुरबा आया है बाबा मजलिस भी करूंगा तेरा मातम भी करूंगा मजलिस भी करूंगा तेरा मातम भी करूंगा रोने तुझे बीमार इधर आया है बाबा सजाद गरीबुल गुरबा आया है बाबा पर मोहम्मद इन वाले मोहम्मद सलवाद सूरत अल मुबारक अल Sheikh Bilal, Sayyid Nizamuddin Ahmad, respected elders, brothers and sisters of Iman, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We would like to welcome our guest speaker, Sayyid Nizamuddin Ahmad, to our center. He brings with him a wealth of knowledge based on research that he has been conducting throughout many years on Islamic jurisprudence. He has lectured at many well renowned institutions worldwide. Sayyid Nizamuddin, we welcome you to our center. We would like to inform our members here that our committee will be planning a general body meeting to address our upcoming plans for our center. We will also be discussing our thoughts around Al Hussein, Al Husseini Madrasa, and of course our property in Jericho. Formal dates will be announced shortly. The Al Mahdi Outreach and Welfare joins hands with Who is Hussein organization to collect warm clothing as well as non-perishable food items, all to be distributed to the needy in New York City. Please take part in this charitable cause. Collection boxes are placed both in the gents as well as ladies side. There will be a flyer with more details to be posted on our broadcasts. Tomorrow Sunday, Madrasa will be starting at 10.30 as the students will be performing a play on Bibi Fatima. On Tuesday, Dua Tawassal is for boys and girls. Tonight's Surya Asin will sponsor for the Ithada Thwa for the following Marhumins that are displayed on the screen. Let us all recite Surah Fatiha for all Marhumins. Bismillah. Please join me in reciting the ayah of Amma Yujib five times for all those who are sick here and around the world. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. 
Amma yujibul mustarraiza dahu wa yakshifu su 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 Muhammad Wali Muhammad Salawat. I'd like to call upon our president, Brother Hussain Aziz, to say a few words. From Muhammad Wali Muhammad Salawat. My elders, my brothers, this is Nizman. Salamun alaikum. Before I start, I know a lot of people are wishing me condolences today. Yes, my team England lost. I will take it like a man, Uncle Ahmad, so no problem. Yes, that's true, but England is my love. With that said, on behalf of our community here at Al Mahdi Center, I would like to welcome a very special guest, Sayyid Nizamuddin Ahmad. He's currently the Prophet Muhammad University professor of Shia Islam Studies at Florida International University. He is also Honorary Senior Research Fellow in the Institute of Arabic and Islamic Studies, University of Exeter, as well as being a faculty member of Mufid Academic Seminary in Fairfax, Virginia. And before I go more into the details of Sayyid Nizamuddin, we also have another guest with us today, and he's also at a very high level in the academic world, and that's Brother Hussein Kamal. He is the chair of the Shia Islamic Studies at the Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. Some of you may recall, Sheikh Amar was instrumental in that, getting that going, but then of course, Brother Hussein now is leading that institution. Said Nizam received his MA and PhD in Islamic Studies from Princeton University. He also holds an MA in Arabic from Indiana University and a Bachelor of Science degree in Pure Mathematics from Purdue University. He has taught at the University of Texas at Austin, the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization in Kuala Lumpur, the American University of Sharjah, and the American University in Cairo. Dr. Ahmad has about 20 years of teaching experience, having served on the faculties of a number of universities and research institutes both in the United States and abroad. From 2015 to 2017, he was a fellow and later a reader in Shia studies at the Shia Institute in London. From 2008 to 2015, he taught in the Department of Arabic and Islamic Civilizations at the American University in Cairo. Prior to this, he taught at the American University in Sharjah, the University of Texas at Austin, as well as, of course, as I mentioned, the National Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Dr. Ahmad has presented scholarly papers on a very wide range of subjects at some of the most renowned institutions of learning in both the East and the West, namely Oxford University, where our own Nabil, he's actually in the uh, audio video room, Nabil Pirmuad, as you know, he's pursuing further studies there. He's, uh, Dr. Nizam also has been in, at Cambridge University and the Warburg Institute School of Advanced Study at the University of London the American University of Beirut, Institute Francois d'Egypte, and the International Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies, of course, in Malaysia, as I mentioned. His most recent publications, or soon-to-be-published books, are The Way of Nobility, Knowledge of the Imam, Philosophy and the Intellectual Life in Shia Islam, Universal Science and Introduction to Islamic Metaphysics, Miraj al-Uqul Shar Dua al-Mashlul, the Ascension of the Intellect's Commentary on the Supplication of the Lame, Fusus al-Hikam by, again he's been working with the, several researchers in there, a critical edition with introduction and notes, and Fatwas of Condemnation, Islam and the Limits of Dissent. Dr. Ahmad has presented scholarly papers on a wide range of subjects at some of the most renowned institutions of learning, that includes Oxford University, Cambridge University, Warburg Institute, American University of Beirut, Institute Francois de Egypt, and of course, Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies in Malaysia. Dr. Ahmad, it is indeed our utmost pleasure and honor 
to have you with us today as you, pre as you present the topic of the origin and the return and inquire into the meaning of human existence. And before I ask Sheikh Bilal to come forward and formally introduce our guest, I must say we had spent some about 15 minutes in the conference room with our honorable guest as well as uh, the other brother from the University of Harvard, Dr. Hassan Kamal, as I mentioned. And it was really impressive as I sat with them and talked about their vision. And truly, when you think about where we are falling short here growing up in the West, and if you really think about it, and I've had this, a lot of discussion with Sheikh Bilal, when you think about our madrasa, we cater to our students till the age of about 15, 16. Then they graduate from madrasa. And there's that period of two years, three years before these kids go to college, which I, I consider probably the most critical period because that's what shapes them. At that point in time, we don't have a formal Islamic education for them. And that's where some of them, and let's be honest and blunt about it, we lose them. If the parents don't get involved deeply during that age, we lose them. A lot of youths, we have lost them because of this. So it was great to hear from Sheikh Nizam and Brother Hassan Hussein and Sheikh Bilal that some of the work they'll be doing across the United States will be sort of catering to that as well amidst other things that they'll be working on. So I would like our honorable guests, of course, to mention some of this great work. But without further ado, I would like to ask Sheikh Bilal to please formally come forward and introduce our guest. From Muhammad Wali Muhammad, salawat. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وأهل بيته التيبين الطاهرين سلوة على محمد وآل محمد ما شاء الله In context, very briefly to point out the diaspora of American Muslims needs resources while the mimbar in its traditional format is our inheritance and it holds a place in our community and in our future part of speaking to both American Shia Muslims American Muslims and the American society as a whole is on the basis of common ground the use of academic analysis, academic theory, and position within both universities, schools, and educational institutions is an important tool that we utilize in speaking about Islam, both increasing our understanding about the religion as well as finding the common ground in society to talk about Islam in an intellectual and less traditional format. As such, Dedicated individuals who have dedicated their lives in scholarly and academic research to further these pursuits are present amongst us today. We have the honor of listening to Sayyid Nizamuddin Ahmad today. And inshallah with tawfiq, we will have the opportunity to listen to Haj Allah Hussein Kamali as well in the future as well. The opportunity that we have before us is not a one-off opportunity but rather it is something that we need to build into our communities that will further give us the tools and improve both our ability to think about the religion of Islam and our ability to communicate about the religion of Islam in society at large. As such, I invite all of us to ponder the lecture tonight, thank our speaker and our guest very humbly for taking the opportunity to spend time with us and look forward to the opportunity to create more of these events that broaden our perspective and our communication about our faith, our ideology, and our lifestyle. With your loudest of salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Thank you, Shukriya. Can everyone hear me? Okay. 
أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين الإنسان الكامل والكون الجامع الشامل النبي الأمجد والرسول المسدد سيدنا بالقاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله تعالى بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الأول والآخر والظاهر والباطن صدق الله العلي العظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى has stated that he is the first he is the last he is the outwardly manifest and he is the inwardly hidden it is fitting that uh, I commence today's discourse with this noble statement. The title of this lecture is The Origin and the Return, an Inquiry into the Meaning of Human Existence. I have actually taken this title the origin and the return from the title or from a title which has been used for more than one book in our intellectual tradition. These books are in Arabic or in Persian and in Arabic they go by the title in Arabic of course of Al-Mabda Wal Ma'ad and in Persian by the title of Aghazu and Jam. So there is more than one book that bears this title in our intellectual tradition, but perhaps the most significant of them is the one by Sadr al-Din al-Shirazi Mullah Sadra, who is a very, very important figure in our tradition from the 17th century of the Christian calendar or the 12th century of the Hijra calendar and what I really have in mind here is the notion of the origin or the beginning the beginning and the end as it were the beginning and the end of human existence and the reason that I chose this topic actually there's a bit of an anecdote behind it and so um, a few weeks back, maybe four or five, six weeks ago, I was actually here also, and I was visiting um, uh, my friend, a very well-known person in your community, uh, Mr. Uh, Mohsin Meiji. And we started uh, a little discussion about a number of topics, and a question came up, and it's a question that comes up a lot. And we spoke about this together for some time, and then he said, well, this could be an excellent topic. And there's actually a further backstory to this. Well, some years back, before the just before the lockdown, in fact, I was in London, and um, this very question came up in a very nice gathering there, in similar circumstances, and that is the question of really, what is the point? So, in the context context of what happened in London. Well, there were some young people, we were sitting, we were just enjoying ourselves. It was night time, it was very cold at that time in London. And various topics were being talked about, and then all of a sudden, one of the young men present, he just raised this question, and he said, you know, why? What really is the point? And when he was asked, what do you mean? He said, well, I didn't ask to come here meaning into the world, not, not to the gathering in London. And Allah doesn't need me, and He doesn't need you. He doesn't need any of us. 
He doesn't need the world. So what's the point? And I thought that was really a very good question. And I think that that question itself indicates a great deal about this particular historical moment in which we find ourselves. Let me explain. Now this young man was asking this question with the best of intentions and he really wanted an answer. And I didn't really have, I didn't know him, but by the context it really didn't seem to me that he was a person who was in, uh, going through some sort of despair or anything. He simply wanted to know. But we live in an age of meaninglessness. We live in an age of alienation. We live in an age in which the very meaning of truth has been lost. The very meaning of the ultimately real has been completely obscured. And the whole of modern society, in some truly diabolical, diabolical that means shaitani way, collaborates to completely make human beings forget the true purpose of existence. Now there are many of you here who are very well educated, you've gone to universities, some of you are studying mashallah in Oxford University as well and uh, you know I've studied in my share of universities also. Uh, in fact the university is something I know quite well and I can tell you that none of you and I didn't in all the places I went to, nobody answered a fundamental question. And that is what is the nature of man? What is the human being? And what is the goal or the end of existence? So the term end in English doesn't mean like the end, like the end of the, of the game today <laughs> that happened. It also means the goal. To what end are you studying? In other words, what's the goal? Oh, you know, I want to get a degree, get a job in a company. That's the end. That's the goal. So modern society does not really have an answer to what the ultimate end of human existence is. And if you can't answer this question, it doesn't matter how many universities you've studied in, how many pieces of paper and degrees you have, how many things you have after your name, you really don't know anything. So the entire society as we have it now is constructed in such a way that it makes you focus purely on material existence. Modern science as well only looks at the world of materiality. And that really is the reason that there is so much meaninglessness today because they don't really have a real answer to this question. And these works which were written in the Islamic intellectual tradition in the past in Arabic and Persian which were devoted to this question of the origin and the return directly address these things. So to put it in the most immediate sense for all of you, human life has a beginning. We come into this world when we are born and we don't have control over that. And then human life has an end and even though we think we have control over things, nobody controls when and where and how they die. So these are the parameters for the individual human life. The universe as well, in its entirety, or if you prefer the cosmos, also has a beginning and it will have an end. So how does the Islamic tradition look at this? Why indeed does Allah need to create the universe? If he is not in need of anything, every child knows the surah Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad. Say he is Allah, the utterly unique. That's the really correct translation. People often translate it as one. Allah is not really numerically one. And if you translate that saying Allah is one, you have the possibility that you mean one, and then one plus one is two, and two plus one is three. It really means he is unique, like in the sense of. Uh, the words we use in Urdu as well as in Persian of yakta, yakta or yagana, meaning unique. And he is a samad, he is the infinitely self-sufficient. So if Allah is absolutely and utterly self-sufficient, and the cosmos, the universe, and every single one of us is in a state of perpetual need, 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he doesn't need us why did any of this come about now if you haven't thought about it this is a good time to think about it and I want to say there's nothing wrong with asking this question it's a difficult question and I want to say there's nothing wrong with asking other questions as well as difficult as they may be I read a book a long time ago by um, an American Muslim uh, someone who converted to Islam and he gave it a very interesting title and you know I was raised as a Muslim I never thought of it this way and it was called even angels ask um, because even the angels asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know what are you doing when he said we're creating Adam so there's nothing wrong with asking however when a person asks a question then they have to understand that they may not be qualified to accept the answer in other words they may have to do some work to get at the answer and if they find someone who can tell them the answer they may have to be patient and listen to what the answer is at length and this is what I told the young man when he asked me I said I need some time you have to be patient I'll be happy to answer you and so I beg your indulgence as well <coughs> these are questions which can't be dealt with in a tweet 140 characters they have to be understood on a very profound sort of level so let us look at that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ultimately he is pure existence he is pure existence and he is pure actuality in act what this means is that if you look at anything in the world if you look around you take any object it could be an artifact of human ingenuity like an iPhone or it could be something which we find naturally occurring in nature like a rose a human artifact would be something like your cell phone so let's take the example of the cell phone I am old enough to remember when there were no cell phones so at some point the cell phone was invented that means it was in the mind of some creative individual and then he came up with a design and there was a prototype and then they uh, designed a bunch of processes so you could have a factory and it could be mass produced and people could make money off of it right the point is that you can conceive of the idea of the phone separate from its existence because at one time it didn't exist so that phone's existence depends on or we say in philosophy it is contingent upon a number of factors causes and conditions and a web of causes and conditions the same is true for a rose as sophisticated as modern science botany biology have become they cannot make a rose out of nothing they can grow it they can get the seeds they can plant the seeds and they can facilitate its growth by watering it and being sure that it receives sufficient air and sunlight these are what we would call the efficient causes in philosophical language and Allah has placed it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has placed a kind of mm, um, um, a potential contingency or propensive contingency these are fancy words or what's called in Arabic al-imkanul isti'adadi simply meaning that if you water this seed and you make sure it gets its nutrients it's gonna grow it has this tendency so modern science cannot do that but you can also conceive of the non-existence of the rose right so everything in the universe depends on some sort of an existentiating cause something that bestows existence upon it and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so existence itself is what we would say is good it is a good it is a khair in and of itself the absence of something is really bad and some absences are classified as evil so it is also the nature of existence to manifest itself and existence is synonymous as I already said with the ultimate good and it's also synonymous with the ultimate truth now think about that think about truth as a as in, pro, in, in, in any kind of a proposition if I make a claim and say that I was in, uh, in Miami five weeks ago I either was or I wasn't so the statement is true or false and that's the very basic notion of truth and logic but truth as such is also synonymous with existence and even though human beings have a tendency to lie 
And I would say that we really live in an age which is characterized again by lies, by all sorts of falsehoods. But sooner or later, as we say in English, the truth comes out. The truth comes out. Because as we say in Arabic, من طبيع طبيعة الحق أن يظهر It is in the nature of truth that it becomes clear, that it becomes manifest. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate truth because He is utterly real. And that is what truth means. So truth by its very nature cannot remain hidden. This is the first point in understanding the origin of the cosmos. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely and totally pure being. What's called in Arabic, Al-Wujudul Mahab, Hastiya Mahaz. Allah is Hastiya Mahaz. He is pure existence. He is sheer being. And he manifests himself also in the way of the divine attributes, the divine names. Allah has an infinite number of names or attributes and there are some which have been singled out in the Quran and other traditions and in other, for example, prayers like Dua al jawshan Al-Kabir, Dua Al-Mashlul, there are many different divine names. And our ulama have written extensively on this. So if you think about these divine names, if Allah is Ar-Rahman or Ar-Rahim, Ar-Rahman would be the infinitely compassionate, Ar-Rahim is the ever-merciful, Al-Khaliq is the creator, right? Al-Ghafoor is the all-forgiving. Allah, to forgive, He needs someone who needs, we use provisionally, but the notion of forgiveness requires and necessitates by its nature someone who has transgressed. You, uh, even in, in human relations, you can only forgive someone who's done something against you. You, know, you don't forgive someone for helping you. You don't forgive someone you know, who makes a donation to the mosque. You don't forgive someone who gives you a gift for, for whatever reason. Right? You thank them. <laughs> so, Trans- there's some sort of transgression is necessitated by the notion of forgiveness. So there is this idea in Islamic philosophy that for the full manifestation of these divine names and divine attributes, the universe has to exist in some way. But it is also possible, and, and in our tradition as well, to conceive of the divine in a completely unmanifested and unknowable state. This is the doctrine of the divine essence or what's called a that in Arabic. The word is that. And you use it in other languages like Urdu and Persian, you just pronounce it as zat. So if you can understand the notion of existence or being, you can also understand the notion of being without any conditions. And Allah strictly speaking is not subject strictly speaking is not subject to any kind of conditions. And so in Islamic philosophy, the idea is there of what is called al-wujud or existence bila shart, meaning existence in an utterly non-conditioned state. So much so, and existence of course if we use theological language is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah before, and even when we say before, we don't mean in the sense of time, logically before the creation of the cosmos before this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in a completely unmanifested unconditioned or we could say non-conditioned state he is utterly non-conditioned existence is so utterly non-conditioned that it is even beyond the condition of being non-conditioned and so this is a state of tremendous potentiality meaning it's it we utterly cannot know it it, because it is the most indefinite of all things. But that complete indefinitude has within it an infinitude of possibilities. And so there is a tradition which is much cited, although many of the stricter scholars of hadith may question it, but the Arafa in our tradition, uh, many of the great 
philosophers and Orofa like Mullah Sadra, like Sabzawari, Mullah Hadi Sabzawari, who's from the 19th century of the Christian calendar, and many, many, many others, cite this tradition or Hadith Qudsi in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reported to say, Kuntu kanzan makhfiyan fa'ahbabtu an u'arafa fa'khalaqtu al-khalqa likay u'araf. Kuntu kanzan makhfiyan. I was a hidden treasure. Kuntu kanzan makhfiyan. I was a hidden treasure. Fa'ahbabtu an u'araf. And I loved to be known. Fa'khalaqtu al-khalqa. Thus did I create the creation so that they may know me. So it is in the nature of pure existence in its non-conditioned state to not stay like that indefinitely. The absolute as ultimate reality as pure being must manifest itself and it manifests in stages and again these stages are our understanding because this is not a time process or a temporal process because Allah is beyond time you and I are not beyond time I'm, I'm on the clock here also I'm looking at the clock to see how much time I have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above and beyond time He is not bound by time and space conditions and so when we speak of this Allah's manifestation or the manifestation of pure existence begins its mabda, its beginning so to speak and again, not a temporal beginning, is in a state of utter non-conditionality. Then it moves to a state, so to speak, moving again, not in space, to a state of negative conditionality, by which we can say what Allah is not. And then, that's called al-wujud bi la in Arabic, non-conditioned being. And then it moves, again, figuratively speaking, to a state of al-wujud bi sharti shay. In other words, wujud or existence subject to some condition. And that is how we have the manifestation of the divine names. And this is a process that is intrinsic and part of the divine nature itself. So as we said, min tabi'at al haqqan yadhar. It is from the nature of pure being or existence to manifest itself, to emerge, to emanate as it were. You can think of, and many of the great scholars of our tradition have spoken about light as a metaphor for this. In uh, being inspired by the verse of light Allahu nuru samawati wal ard mathalu nurihi kamishkatin fiha misbah to the end of the ayah meaning Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth it, his light is like a, like a niche in which there is a lamp etc so this is the nature of things in other words it is the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself to manifest aha alright so then fine how then does that impinge or impact upon the human being and human existence? Because what I've just talked to you here is a lot of very high uh, you know, metaphysics and fancy words and so forth, even though I've really tried to present it in, 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 in the simplest way possible. It is a rather sophisticated philosophical and metaphysical discussion. But in terms of each individual human being, what does that possibly mean? That is the next point which I would like to address. And here we can go directly to some verses from the Quran and also a tradition of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So there's a very, very well-known verse in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونِ Meaning, and I have created jinn and mankind, or if you prefer humankind, only that they may worship me. And it's fascinating that there was a, there's a very important hadith of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam, and he was asked this, and this is widely cited, not only in our books, but also in the books of our Sunni brothers. Very recent example, those of you who know Urdu, you may have heard of a tafsir in Urdu called tafsir al majidi written by Abdul Majid Daryabadi. That's about as Sunni as you can get in the Indian subcontinent. You know, he's a Diobandi, I think, Diobandi leaning, you know, was associated with Maulana Ashraf Ali Thanvi. These are big names in the world of Sunni. 
<coughs> Sunni uh, uh, Islamic scholarship and he cites this tradition so Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam was asked what does this ayah mean? وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونِ he said لِيَعْرُفُونِ it means so that they may know me so ibadah is not just a bunch of physical exercises you know, standing up, sitting down going around the Kaaba there's a physical dimension, right? Uh, there's a physical dimension even with fasting although you don't see it but it, 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 you know, fasting directly uh, impinges upon your your, um, your body and your mind the, the psychosomatic matrix as it were the, the connection between body and soul <coughs> but ultimately the goal of all of these rituals is knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the word ritual is also rather interesting um, ritual and r- the word ritual as well as the word rite R-I-T-E um, if you study comparative linguistics and languages you find that it is cognate to a word in Sanskrit which is rita and rita means the actual sort of pattern of existence above and beyond merely mere physical laws but just like it is exactly like the concept in Islam of sunnatullah what we sunnatullah we could cl- we could translate into English as the divine pattern which is imprinted on the cosmos there's a certain nature of things there's a certain connection between relationship between cause and effect which is only rarely uh, uh, changed in the form of miracles uh, so I think that's a that's very interesting that the ritual and we're, sp- we're speaking in English of course in Arabic there's different words but the ritual the idea of ritual act and rites R-I-T-E-S is intimately connected in the original meaning of these terms in English with the order of nature the natural way what in Arabic is called the fitra and again this has been forgotten because the western civilization has moved away from its roots and has gone in a completely secular direction so in the case of the human being the ultimate goal of existence is worship and this is made very very clear in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah in terms of the creation of the human being very important in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ قال ربك للملائكة إني جاعل في الأرض خليفة قال وتجعل فيها من يفسد فيها ويسفك الدماء ونحن نسبح بحمدك ونقندس لك قال إني أعلم ما لا تعلمون صدق الله العلي العظيم وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ And when your Lord said to the angels إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةِ I am creating or making or placing different ways you could translate upon the earth a vice turned قَالُوا They said أَتَّجْعَلُوا فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا Will you place therein one who will make mischief therein وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءَ And shed blood وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ Whereas we sing your praises وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ And sanctify you Even angels ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ I know that which you know not وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا And he taught Adam the names all of them. ثُمَّ عَرَضَهُمْ عَلَى الْمَلَائِكَةِ Then he placed certain entities before the angels. And he said to them, أَنْبِئُونِي بِأَسْمَائِهَا أُولَئِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Tell me then the names of them, if indeed you are truthful. قَالُوا سُبْحَانَكَ لَا عِلْمَ لَنَا إِلَّا مَا عَلَّمْتَنَا And the angel said, you know, we have no knowledge except that which you have taught us. And it goes on. So here we see that the human being and the Prophet Adam alayhi salam here is symbolic of primordial humanity. So the very nature of the human being is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught Adam that nominal realities if I translate more philosophically rather than just saying names the nominal realities of all things 
what I mean by this is it's not just names. If I tell you the name of something, and this is very important for especially young children when they're learning language, they say, oh, what is this? They don't know what it is. They see something, they conceive of it, they uh, um, perceive it with their full senses, but they don't know what it is. And you say, well, it's a sheep, for example. And then the child says, ah, sheep. And so it makes an association between some sounds in the language which spell sheep and this animal. Then the same child sees another sheep. Maybe they're driving around somewhere. And he says, Abba, Abba, look, look, a sheep. And he says, yeah, bete, yes, that's right, that's a sheep. And then the kid sees a sheep again and again and again. And he has a concept of a sheep. And then in school he draws a sheep, but there's no sheep around. And 50 years later he still knows what a sheep is. And then the same thing happens with his child, for example. So the human being can conceive of, is capable of abstraction or abstract thought. You see one tree or one sheep or one whatever and then you have a notion of a general notion of what's called a universal in philosophy. Only human beings ha are capable of abstraction and, and this kind of um, arriving at universal knowledge. So this is the understanding that some people have of this notion of teaching all of the names because human beings are distinguished from plants and animals by the different nature of their soul. The soul is simply the principle of life and every human being can distinguish between a living thing and a dead thing. To put it in the most simple terms, living things move in some sense. Even plants do. They follow the sun, they're rooted in one place and they have various other processes like absorbing nutrients from the environment. Plants do this. And, and they remake themselves, they reproduce. Animals do all of that and more. The animals can move around. They have complete locomotion. They have some degree of you know, choice. You know, the cat will decide whether it's going to eat this thing or not. Right? Human beings have all of this and more, but we have abstractions. So there's a difference between the kind of principal life or the soul and plants and the soul and animals and the soul and human beings. And what distinguishes human beings is this rational soul or what's called an nafsun natika in Arabic. So this is also one understanding. Another understanding is that that also includes the divine names. The human beings have an implicit sort of understanding of this notion of divine attributes and divine names. And this is what we have been sent here to do, to perfect this knowledge. So human beings were not sent to the world as a form of punishment. It's true we don't choose to come here. But Allah has not sent us here to punish us. He has sent us here to complete us. This is a journey of completion. It is a journey toward kamal or perfection, but not you know, perfection. You know, the word kamal in Arabic also means completion. Perfection doesn't mean that you and I will become like the prophets on the night and we're like any of the masumin. That's impossible. We can, we can asymptotically approach, as we say, but we will never actually get there. It's an ideal that we strive for. But within that, that is what we are sent to do here. So when the human soul, as Mullah Sadra says, comes into the world, it is joined to the body. He says that the soul itself is created ex nihilo, out of nothing, but it is joined with the body at a particular point. When that happens is a question of much debate. And the human soul is joined to the body and it needs the body because the human soul at the beginning, at the origin of human life, is pure potential. You can make that human child into almost anything. But that needs proper tarbiyah, proper education, proper opportunities. And then after a certain level has reached, then that individual, that child, whether it's man or woman, whether it's girl or boy, male or female, has a free will. And they have, therefore, the ability to choose to obey or disobey. So we have no choice in coming into the world. We have no say in what's called al-amru takwini or the command of existence. When Allah says for something to exist, it exists. Then there's something called al-amru tashri'i, the legislative command. Allah says, you have to do namaz. You have to do you know, five daily prayers. You've got to wake up for fajr. You've got to do this. You've got to do all these things that you need to do. You can choose to do or not to do. And he says, that's fine, you can choose to do or not to do, but things have consequences. Actions have consequences. So, the human soul at the beginning, at the origin, is a pure potentiality. 
doesn't mean you can be or become anything, but there are certain things which are latent within the human being, certain latencies, certain potentialities, which are in a state of, obviously, potency, or what is called in Arabic, al quwa or bil quwa In Urdu we'll say bil quwat This is the Arabic word pronounced in an Indian, Pakistani way. And those latencies have to be developed. They have to be nurtured. They have to be brought out. They must be brought from potency to act. To from potency or from potentiality to actuality. They must go from what we say in Arabic, bil quwa to bil fa'al, bil quwat to bil fail. This is ultimately what the entire structures of religion or ad-deen are about. That is actually the goal of human existence. So you may do any number of things, but if you are not working on the actualization of those potentialities, then there are consequences when we die. And so if at the beginning, at the origin, the human soul is pure potentiality, then ideally at the end it should be pure actuality. In other words, all of those latencies which are there have to be developed. That is our task. That is really what the ultimate end and goal of existence has to be. And everything really in all of the rituals is designed for this. But it's more than just the ritual actions which we do. Above and beyond that, that is the, there is the practice of virtue, the practice of ihsan, doing beautiful actions, do, striving for excellence in what we do. So that is really the ultimate end of existence. And Mullah Sadra, again, I, he's a very important figure. He wrote a very important book called The Origin and Return. He says that the human being, and in fact he says everything, is in a state of constant motion or flux. What he calls al-harakatu fil jawhar, again a fancy term, but motion in the category of substance. Don't worry about the term. It's not important. What I want you to understand is that everything is in a state of flux. It's constantly undergoing some sort of change. And that is true of the human being itself because the human soul is considered to be a so-called substance in Islamic philosophy or Johar or Gohar in Persian. And it too is constantly undergoing this kind of flux or change because it is moving from potentiality to actuality. The difference is that we as human beings have a choice. We can develop the wrong potentialities. Somebody might be really good at talking and convincing people, well he could go and become a con man and cheat them. Astaghfirullah alazim. But that's a potentiality, but that's one that shouldn't be developed in that direction should be developed in another way. They're very convincing. They have a good command of language. Or maybe they can you know, become an orator. Maybe they can become a professor. Maybe they can become a teacher. Something like this, right? You, you understand. It's just a simple example to indicate that potential, potentialities can also be developed in the wrong way. So there are choices. And if the human being makes a lot of wrong choices, then what do you think happens when they die? If you've done, the, done it right, then when you die, you almost become a kind of a luminous being who then goes into the grave and in the in-between state, the barzakh, and you have a vision of what will happen to you in Jannah after the whole thing is over when the Day of Judgment comes. But if you've done things in the wrong way, and you've made way too many wrong choices, and of course there's the, the office provision, and let's say, God forbid, you did that, but you realized and you did tawbah. Tawbah is possible. Hur famous story in our tradition, right? So if you haven't done that and you die, then at your death you will be confronted by the dark shadow of your deeds. <clears throat> so this is the meaning of the end for the human being. And that is an end which no one can escape. And it's confirmed. We know it's going to happen. So it behooves the human being to prepare for that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is awwal, He is the first, and He is the last. He is the outwardly hidden, sorry, He is the outwardly manifest, excuse me, and the inwardly hidden. And I can think of no better way to sort of wrap all of this up 
And then to have a quotation, and it also is fitting the occasion, from our Imam Ali Zainul Abidin. Now I've already spoken a lot, so I just beg your patience for another minute or two, and I'm not going to read this whole thing for you. But in a Sahifat al Sajjadiyya, this very important work of the <coughs> invocations of Imam Ali Zainul Abidin, it begins with the origin and the return. So if you haven't read it in this light, it would be a good idea to go back and maybe look at this text. The whole thing is translated into English. And this is the nature of these texts from the Imams. We have to return to them constantly and try and derive a benefit and an inspiration. And they have that kind of an infinite possibility within them. So in the very first opening line, he says, Alhamdulillah al awwali bila awwalin kana qabla. Praise is due to Allah, the first, who is utterly without any kind of a first that precedes him or comes before him. Wal akhiri bila akhirin yakunu ba'da. And the last, without any kind of a last that succeeds him or comes after him. الَّذِي قَصُرَتْ عَنْ رُوْيَتِهِ أَبْصَارُ النَّاظِرِينَ He's the one regarding whom those who are endowed with vision or the faculty of sight, they are utterly unable and weak in being able to perceive him through the faculty of vision. I'm sort of paraphrasing and expanding on the Arabic to make it clearer. وَعَجَزَتْ عَنْ نَعْتِهِ أَوْهَامُ الْوَاصِفِينَ And those who have attempt to, attempted to describe him in their imagination are also utterly unable to achieve this. And the whole text goes on. So this notion of the origin and in the return is right there in the very opening lines of this. And I think that this is an extremely neglected work. There have been commentaries that have been written on this. None of them have been translated into English. Alhamdulillah, there is an English translation by William C. Chittick. It's available. But I think that, and this is just a humble suggestion from my side, that we need to emphasize the recitation and the study of this work in our centers. Because Imam Ali Zainul Abideen, is known for this utter devotion to worship. That's why he's known as Zainul Abidin, the adornment of the worshippers. And to worship, to perform the ritual, the rite, is to know Allah, ultimately to seek to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is also known as Sayyidus Sajideen, the Lord or masters of those who bow before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the sajda is the culmination of the salah. And the salah has been called by many people as the mi'raj al-mu'min, the ascent of the believer. And this entire work is full of this state of complete and total worship or what we may call servitude in English, the Arabic ubudiyya. What is the ultimate message of the Ahlul Bayt. It is Ubudiyya. It is servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the complete elimination of self and ego before God, of which the culmination is the sajda. That is not easy to achieve. This is a model and a pathway for achieving that. But what is required in this? What is required in this is what we may refer to in English as ascesis. A-S-K-E-S-I-S. You've probably never heard of the word. It comes from Greek. And it's from that Greek word that we have another word in English which is asceticism, which is spelled differently. A-S-C-E-T-I-C-I-S-M. Well, ascesis and asceticism are two different things. Asceticism is associated with 
austerities, long fasts, all of this is also part of our tradition, but it's not an end in itself, and that's what often is meant by the term asceticism, and it's also perceived as being difficult and arduous by modern people, because modern people will put up with any difficulty if it involves money or if it involves financial gain or material enrichment. But when it comes to the spiritual path, oh no, that's too hard, man. Oh, you want me to say astaghfirullah 124,000 times? Dude, I got stuff to do. They don't want to do it. That's what they think asceticism is. Ascasis is the overcoming through an act of will on the part of the human being, because we have free will, and overcoming of our contingencies. Contingency are the limits you know, that we have. Oh God, you know, waking up for Fajr is a real drag, man. Namaz is shut three o'clock in the morning. God, man, how am I going to do that? I got to fast for 10 more days. Ramadan isn't over. These are our contingencies. We must overcome those contingencies. It is a kind of a true jihad. What the Prophet Muhammad wasallam called the greater... Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The greater jihad. Very famous hadith. It's in Sunni tradition as well. When the Prophet ﷺ returned from the Ghazwa Tabuk, the military expedition to Tabuk, and he said to them, you know, we have returned from the greater jihad, the actual struggle with, 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 with um, the forces of our world on the field of battle. We have returned from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad. And they said, Ya Rasulullah ﷺ, what is the greater jihad? And he says, jihad and nafs. The war, and it is a war, the struggle against the self, the baser self. That is escasis. That is the overcoming of our contingencies. That is what the ultimate goal and end of religion is. And if you do that, and if you strive on that, then you are on the correct path from the origin to the return, from the mabda to the ma'ad, from the aghaz to the anjam. And for human beings, your death is your anjam. It is your end. And when the person dies, they say, qamat qiyamatuhu. Your qiyama has begun. If we do this, if we strive in this direction, then we will truly find and experience transcendence, joy, and we will experience beauty. There's a beautiful line of poetry, which I will conclude with, but first I want to say that that overcoming of contingencies is a kind of death itself. It's a death before death. So the Prophet Muhammad said, Mutu qabl an tamutu, die before you die. Imam Ali salam said that Anasu Niyam wa idamatu an tabahu. Human beings are asleep. When they die, they wake up. And so there is a kind of death before death the culmination of escasis, the struggling against our contingencies, which truly brings us to transcendence and to the true experience of what it means to be a human being. And if we do that, we will also find joy in that. It will stop being difficult. We will do it with happiness, with willingness, with, and we will truly attain to a kind of bliss. So there's a poet in the Persian language named Ahmad Ijam who, res, who has a very famous line of poetry at least famous in, the, in, in, in pre-modern India before Pakistan, Bangladesh and all of that was made and it is said that this line of poetry was once recited in the gathering of a great saint in India named Nizamuddin Awliya and when this verse was recited one person stood up and he was so utterly moved by it that he demanded the reciter to recite it again and again. And this went on until he himself died. And the verse is as follows. Kushtagane khanjari taslim ra har zaman zhaib jane digarast. It means that those who are slain by the dagger of submission, submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are at every instant granted new life. With that, I think there is nothing more that can or should be said.
والله اعلم question and answer session or something if you do I can I can take them here on the phone. If there are any questions. Any questions or share this uh please no formality any questions. No please any questions. This is one question Mike اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد a deeper understanding of what I talked about Yes, well, you have to go to the original sources. I think there is a tremendous need for people who are really interested in this subject to uh, study Arabic, to study Persian, to refer to these original sources. Of course, that's setting the bar very high, but at the, this moment, that's the only way. Um, there's also a need for translation of these into English and other languages. Um, but ultimately, uh, that's what you have to do. There are some very good books about, uh, you know, the, 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 the thought and doctrines of, of Mullah Sadra in English. Um, a very accessible, um, a, perhaps one of the more accessible ones is a book called The Wisdom of the Throne. And it's one of the few, you know, really, I think, competent translations. He is a book he wrote in Arabic called Al-Hikmatul Arshiya. It's translated as The Wisdom of the Throne by James Morris. It was published by Princeton University back in the 80s, but I don't know if it's still in print. So you would have to go to a library and find it. Um, of course, you could also look around online, I know. But I don't, I, and I've done that. I don't know if any PDFs are out there. They may be. I haven't checked in a while. That's what I can advise you. Hmm. Yes, a question all the way in the back. Wa alaikum as salam, it's my pleasure. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, thank you. Mm. Yes. Yes, you, ha you only have limited time. I'm not saying that going to work and having a job and not all this is illegitimate. I, I've never in meant intended to mean that. Um, so it's not a question of, of, I think you're trying to say, well, how do you find time for this? Not even that? There's nothing wrong with the day-to-day. -day. If they're done with the right intention, that day-to-day -day actually becomes an act of worship, but it has to be the right intention. And also, you can't be involved in some sort of a suspect lively, livelihood. I mean, you can't run a liquor store, for example. Okay? That's, that's maybe an obvious or extreme example, but there are all sorts of you know, shady sort of livelihoods and so forth. So your, your earnings have to be halal. You have to you know, sort of be having a, a proper attitude. Even when you go to work, when you go anywhere, you have to have the right mindset. So I think maybe your question, maybe how do you cultivate that mindset or how do you do this? Um, so I think that uh, people who are involved in this are unanimous in this, that the basic minimum that people do really is not enough. It's fine if, you, if that's all you're capable of and doing it, inshallah, you know, it, it will inshallah get you into Jannah, right? But if you want to have this higher sort of understanding, 
um, of a more spiritualized existence, then you have to do more than the bare minimum. And that involves, um, again, not an empty kind of asceticism, but what are called acts of supererogatory devotion or nawafil. And that really enters into a field which generally in our tradition is known as al-irfan al-amali or practical gnosis. Uh, I do not use the term mysticism because the term mysticism, especially in the English language, has very much a kind of, uh, in its actual meaning and usage, a kind of irrational and emotional element involved. And true ascasis is not this. Um, but anyhow, so the, the, they're all sort of in agreement on this. And the bare minimum of that is that you have to be doing additional things. And the most important additional thing, and where it really begins, is what's called in Urdu, Persian, namaz al shab In Arabic, it's Salatul Layl or Salatul Tahajjud. Okay, so that's hard. But, you know, unless you're some sort of a night security person, everybody's at home at that time, but they're asleep. So you've got to make some effort, you know, you've got to get up. Some people get up really early because, you know, they go and they run 20 miles or whatever. That's the kind of mindset you need. It is, in, in some way, kind of a mindset of of physical uh, culture and exercises, or that's something that even secular people are very passionate about, but it is a very similar sort of thing where you've got to be in the gym or whatever regularly, except when it's physical exercise, you know, three days a week might be enough, and you've got your in-between days for recovery and diet. That's, this is every single day. You can't take a break from, like, the five namaz, if you're really serious, you can't take a break from tahajjud. Unless you guys are in a real serious, you know, physical situation, you got a fever or whatever, you can't, you know, you know which shara'an is allowed, right? So you have to have the basic thing like that. And then you have to have a basic kind of regular practice of the invocation of the divine name. Various divine names can be used. And there also has to be a regular practice of salawat on the Prophet so above and beyond, you know, just... You know, you've got to set aside like you're going to do like, I don't know, 1800 salawats a day or something. And the best time to do that is at tahajjud, after tahajjud. And then you're going to do, I don't know, there, there's a whole science behind the numbers as well. But it's usually large repetitions. Like you're going to do, say, la ilaha illallah 2000 times, for example, before your day begins. That's usually how these things are done. That's usually how these things have been done in our tradition. But usually people don't talk about it, especially if they're doing it, it's a private matter. And it is not much written about very openly in the Shia tradition. I'm being very honest with you here. It is very much openly written about, paradoxically, in the Sunni Sufi tradition. But I am of the opinion that much of the history of Sufism, especially the early founders, or in fact, almost every one of them is a descendant of the Prophet ﷺ. Their chains of initiation go back to Ali ibn Abi Talib and almost all of them, the, the key figures, were in some form of taqiyya. And if you actually look at the history of this, you will find that the, there's a huge number of narrations in our tradition that refer to different sort of esoteric knowledge or hidden knowledges and practices and so forth that the very closest companions of the Imams were involved in. And this is an element of spiritual culture which has been neglected in Shi'i communities. There has been a kind of... Mm, uh, there has been a kind of um, legalistic turn, shall we say, or a... Um, a um, overemphasis in my view in day-to-day -day affairs on mere outward aspects of law as though the 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 be-all and end-all of the religion is just to have the Risala Tawzih al-Masail of X or Y or Z and that's the whole of the religion it's not because the number of ayat about law about Sharia or ayat al-Ahkam is about 500 or so out of about 6,000 verses in the Quran, so it's not even 10% of the religion. Um, so when it just comes down to a bunch of different rules and things, you're basically done, then what else are you supposed to do? Well, that is where the whole realm of the practice of virtue, the pra virtues, the practice of um, spirituality and a spiritual kind of mind and attitude comes in. And that, I think, needs to be much, much more emphasized and cultivated in our communities. Awesome, Jake.
We also have a mic here, so for anyone else who has a question, please let me know. Also, we've opened up the, a mic for the ladies. So please, ladies, if there's any question from your side, we have made arrangements for you that you have a mic uh, rotating in the ladies' area. Please ask for it, and please do go ahead with the question. But we have a question from a brother. Oh. Well, uh, Allah has already told that it is that your life is a nice journey and uh, till the dawn comes, you know, mm -hmm. till the day breaks. Till the day break, yeah. And uh, he has given all the help and everything during that time. Uh, we, we know, every one of us know about that, but we have not reflected on that. Mm. Very true. He says, Inna anzal nao fi laylatul qadr. Qadr. Laylatul qadri khairin minal fi shahar. Tanazzalul malayakatu wa ruhu fi ha bezne rabbe min kulli. Amar salamun hi aata matlai fajar. Then your ruh goes away. Yes. He has given you a help also by saying 17 times every day. Seventeen times you ask Allah to use your own will mm. and say, mustafim. Keep me on that, keep me on that. Mm -hmm. So these two things. And besides in Quran, you know, word by word translation, uh Rasul Unse Kaido, Jo Kasrat se Tumare Saat hai. O oh, Rasul, tell them those who are in majority with you that the Jews, Yehud, Nasara and Sabaeen achhe kaam karte hain. Wo mere nazdik hain. Hmm. Rasulullah has given us a very good thing to say 17 times during five namazes. Beshak. Eh dinas sirat al mustaqim. Ji. So Allah has sent us mm -hmm. just for that. That is the meaning of existence, and you go back to it. MashaAllah, thank you for that. Uh, bahut shukriya, janab. Bahut shukriya, mashaAllah. Uh, if there's any questions on the lady side, please do let us know. In the meantime, our former president, Uzanatani, has a question for you, Chef. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Just continuing on the theme uh, that Dr. Raza Zaidi mentioned, and I've always <coughs> wondered, and we have different scholars here also. And I've always wondered about this, um, if there is a possibility, okay, because, you know, we know that if somebody goes to the gym, they are bound to eat healthy food because they care about their health, right? Okay. The same thing, yeah. if the, for those who really care about <coughs> their religion, they want to preserve their religion for their generation, next generation as well. Yeah. I've always wondered if we can have like a cheat sheet, maybe, maybe to, for to speak. So, for example... You know, maybe these are the 14 or 18, 20 things that those who really are passionate about their religion should do. You know, like for example, you mentioned, you know, say, Fasajadiyah, you should read. Maybe, you know, the book of Mama Lee. Maybe, you know, Salatu Tahajjud. It would be good, just, you have, these are the things we should focus. Because I believe one of the aspects of the life in the Western it keeps you in this illusion and makes you lose uh -huh. your time in uh -huh. these abstract things that you do that are of, of lack of importance. Mm -hmm. okay? So you don't have the time to spend on the things that are really important. Yeah. So that's in that context I want to ask. Okay, so I understand your point, but I'm not sure I, uh, I'm not sure I, 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 I perceived the question there. Uh, What's up? What's the list? Okay, okay. Okay, I mean, there are various things which are well known in our tradition. Um, and, you know, they're maybe easy enough to do every now and then, but to really do it all the time 
is, is, is where the challenge is, right? So I, I think that all people in the Islamic tradition, when they talk about Irfan, even Sunni, you know, it doesn't matter, Sunni, Shia, they all agree that you're not getting anywhere unless you do namaz ishab That's the basic thing. Then, you know, we have plenty of things to do in our tradition, but I mean, if you pick up Mafatih al-Jinan and start doing all of those, you're never going to get out of your house. Because there's just so many things there. I, I, I see maybe where, where you're coming, you're, you're, you're nodding in agreement. So there are certain things you can take and then stick to those. The key thing is to take some practices and stick to them. So the basic thing in our tradition is, and here Arabic is important. I mean, if it takes you an hour to recite Dua Kumail, then that, that becomes a chore. You've got to become a bit faster, right? And so there are things like the Dua Sabah, which is extremely well known. Everybody has a copy of it. You can even access it now on your phones. So you do that in the morning, for example. You do Dua Kumail once a week. You do the various Ta'qibat. You take various practices and then you stick to them. Right? One practice which is very well known in the Indian subcontinent, and it's a fascinating that it's, it's across the board, Sunnis and Shi'is both, especially in India and Pakistan. And I want to say this because there has been some recent... Um, yeah, skepticism, we may use the term, shown towards this practice. But that is the recitation of the Nadi Ali. Nadi Ali ya madhara la jayabi tajidu'un laka fi nawabi kullaha minu gha min siyan jalibi ulayat ka ya'ali ya'ali ya'ali. This is a serious practice. And many people who are serious about that, they recite that 110 times every day. Why 110? Because the abjad of the name of Imam Ali alayhi salam is 110. Ayn is 70, Lam is 30, Ya is 10. 110. Right? So there, there is these sorts of practices. So you have to take a certain amount of them and then stick to them and do them. Um, so that's my basic advice. And you, there's a lot of people involved in what's called al-irfan al-amali. You, you, the best thing is actually to seek out someone who can teach it to you, which is not... Um, um, it, which is not a trivial matter nowadays, <laughs> but it is possible. Man jadda wa jadda. He who seeks shall find. There's a question from a brother. Question. Mike. Mm -hmm. Malik, yes, we say Malik Yomadin. Yeah, yeah. Master of the Day of Judgment. Also believe that um, there would be a judgment, right? But then why uh, myself goes towards the uh, towards the uh, other other? Oh. Mm -hmm. Ramadan, mm -hmm. and it goes down, and then goes up and down mm -hmm. and up and down. Mm -hmm. How can I be more consistent? Okay. Well, you know, I don't know what you do for a living, but I imagine that, you know, in seeking your earnings and involved in your job, you're pretty consistent. You don't sort of think like, yeah, I'm not going in today, man. Forget it. You go in every day, probably, unless you're your own boss. Or, but generally speaking, you know, that's, people have to be consistent in their dunyawi life. So you have to bring the same discipline. And the reason that, I'm not saying this about you in particular, sir, but in general, when people don't do that, it's because they don't take it seriously. Why is the word dunya used in Arabic? Do you know where it comes from? <laughs> Dunya comes from a root in Arabic which means dunu. It means something which is near or hanging actually. It's like dates which are hanging on a palm tree and then the, the palm tree sort of leans over and, and, and so the dates are hanging there and you can see them and you can just reach up and grab one and eat it. So the dunya is that which is at near at hand. It is the seemingly immediate, but it isn't. That itself is an illusion. There's a certain degree that you've got to be involved in it because that's why Allah has put us here. But if you lose your focus, that's where you're gone. So you have to bring the same sort of seriousness to it, and, you, and, and okay, so that's a challenge. Well, it's not, who said it was going to be easy? But you've got to commit to it, and you've got to do it. 
And if you can do it in Ramadan, you just gotta, you've got to prolong that. You have to prolong that. But don't set yourself up for failure. It's just like people involved in physical training as ones that, you know, I'm going to bench press this much and I'm going to do this. And they go to the gym a few times like, God, this is awful. I got to go to a chiropractor. This is too much. It's because you set an impossible goal for yourself. Start small and do it consistently for a long time until it becomes a habit. There's a whole psychology of habituation. And it's, it takes time to get good habits. And if you've already formed bad habits, it takes time to get rid of them. But you've got to put in the time. That's the only answer I can give you. There's no sort of magic formula, but if you truly do it with the right intention, and the difficulty that you're encountering, if you're honest about it, instead of going and talking about it with your friend and your wife and whoever, God, this is too hard, you have to address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, say, Ya Allah, this is hard, but I'm trying, help me. Do the tawassal with Imam, uh, name of the Prophet, Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Ahl Bayt, that's what they are there for, so to speak. So you have to be honest with yourself, you have to be honest with him. And if you do that, and if you do it with the right intention, if you move toward him, he will help you, he will make it easier for you. وَمَنْ جَاهِدُ فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنْهُمْ سُبَلَنَا It's like those who strive for us in our cause, we, and it says we verily, we definitely, the way it's said in Arabic, we guide them to our path. So ultimately, the burden is on us. Let me put it to you in a completely different way, which I think will resonate very well with, this, with our Shia community. A lot of times Sunni people ask me, they say, well, you know, this whole Shia thing, I've been reading about it online, doesn't make any sense. And I said, why not? Well, that means that the Prophet ﷺ is a failure. And I said, hasha wa kalla, no way, man, that's not possible. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, that means that, you know, he came and taught all of this, and all these Sahaba, you know, they were just so mediocre and they didn't do it and at least that's what you Shias are saying so that means the Prophet وسلم, is finished. I said absolutely not the Prophet وسلم, his job is وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغ he has conveyed the message after that the responsibility devolves upon you so it's not my fault if X or Y or Z didn't do things as they should have or they went away and so the same thing comes back on us the Prophet وسلم, and the Imams have done their duty they've shown us what to do as we say, you know, the ball is in, in, in our court now. Wallahu a'lam and Allah knows. Jee, Fadiyya. So just a, uh, I've been wondering about this and just wanted to get your thought on this. I think I sure. have, I know the answer, but I'd love to get your opinion on this. Uh -huh. um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent instructions to us through messengers. He did. Um, and then he also speaks about him sending instructions to Musa's mother for example of what to do with the baby now correct, correct. would you consider that an instruction <coughs> to her or it's it how would that come that instruction compare to the instructions that have been revealed to the prophets all right so you have to understand that the Arabic word wahi wahyun uh, has more than one meaning. Words have to be interpreted according to context. And so revelation in one context means a direct communication by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through an angel, usually of something which has to be conveyed. You know, if it's the case of a Rasul, then the Rasul receives a wahi and he, has a ma he not only receives a guidance from Allah, but he has a mission that he has to guide a particular human community at a particular time and place in history. It's only the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, which is for everybody and for all time and the whole story is over and it literally is the last train. And if you don't get on the train, you're, I mean, that's a really bad feeling. You know, I haven't been in this part of the world in a long time, but man, if you're there and you miss your train, that's the feeling. So you've got to get on the train. So that revelation can mean that, but it can also mean a kind of guidance which Allah gives to the, an ordinary person by putting the idea in their heart and strictly speaking that also involves an angelic communication but there's no like direct it, it, because there's all sorts of angels if you actually study about this that have been given different tasks to do <coughs> and so this is also a kind of a communication or a sign and in fact the whole universe is full of signs and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually revealing himself constantly but we don't see. 
maybe this is a, I know, I don't know if I'm making uh, sense here. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, even when you recite the Qur'an, the Imams are on record, alayhi salatu is saying that you know, when you recite the Qur'an, I'm just conveying the meaning. You have to understand that that is a revelation that is happening now. It's Allah is talking, even though it's a human being saying the thing that's happening. So that is just about the Qur'an, a, 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 the written form of the Qur'an as a book, right? But there is another kind of a Qur'an, I would argue. Just bear with me. So the, the Qur'an, if we open it up, we have these, in English we say verses. But in Arabic you don't say verse, we say ayah. Ayah doesn't mean verse in Arabic. If you talk about a verse of poetry, you use a different word in Arabic. The word is bait. Ayah means sign. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Fussalat, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusim hatta yatabayyana lahum annahu al-haq. We will show them our signs. Ayat it says on the horizons and within themselves until it becomes manifestly clear unto them that he is the ultimately real, the absolute truth. So the universe itself is a book of revelation and it is happening all the time. These are the signs, the ayat on the horizons and the ayat within our own souls, our states and so forth that we experience. So that is also a kind of revelation that's happening all the time and Allah has never veiled himself from us. We are veiled by our own actions. So if I shine an extremely bright light onto a person, they can be temporarily or even, God forbid, permanently blinded. Right? Al-ama min shiddat al-nur wal khafa min shiddat al-zuhur. It means that blindness is due to the intensity of light, and Allah's hiddenness is due to the intensity of His manifestation. The manifestation of Allah is happening all the time. But if we want to see that, if we want to experience that, then we have to purify ourselves. You see, you cannot look directly at a light. You, know, you cannot directly experience something unless you are prepared and ready for it. So maybe you have to wear a special glasses or whatever. To, we're stretching our analogy a bit. But in, I'm simply saying that you have to ha undergo a preparation. And if you undergo that preparation, then you will see the signs of Allah all the time. And maybe there will be a fleeting thing that's called a hal. And then when it becomes established, it is called a maqam, a station. Not easy to do. But even if it happens to you once in your life, believe me, it is enough. And the effort that it took to achieve that, even if it took you most of your life or your whole life, it will not have been time wasted. Question from the lady side. I'm 12. How do I show love to Allah? How, how do you show uh, love? I, I'm sorry, I think the message was cut off. Um, Could you I'm repeat the question again, please? Um, how do I show love to Allah? What are the modalities of love to inculcate in children? A 12-year-old is asking for herself uh, and the mother. Uh, how do we show love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? By showing love for that which He asked us to do and moreover by showing love for those whom He loved and loves. Those are of course the Ahlul Bayt. This is a given in our tradition. But genuine love for the Ahlul Bayt means doing what they said. It's not just reciting some poems and then going and doing dot, dot, dot. So it is the true meaning of sort of wala and bara. It's wala, you know, it is actual, complete devotion to the chosen people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then doing what He likes us to do. And it can be very simple, but it's also to do it with the right attitude, to do it with love as well, not oh, here we go again, how to do the namaz, no and maybe in the beginning it can be hard but if again you do it enough and you do it with intention, you say to Allah I'm really trying, it's really hard you know I'm coming home, I'm tired, there's not much time left for namaz, I gotta go I mean, just try and Allah will hear you وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عِنْ وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِي 
And when, and when my servants ask you, O Muhammad, about us, say that I am close, I am near. I, I reply to the one who calls upon me. So Allah is closer to us than our jugular vein. But we forget this. I will give you a symbol, inshallah, to help you understand this. It says in the Quran, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُمْ And He is with you wherever you go. But we know that He's not with us, like you know, He's not like, like you are with me now in this room, in this hall. But He is with us. And we say that Allah is everywhere. And yet we can't see Him. Right? It's kind of a paradox. And I'm saying that you, know, you can see the signs of Allah. Well, here's a symbol for you to understand it. If any of you have studied geometry, just, and if you haven't, pay close attention. Everything has become digital now, but I hope that some of you, you know, you, do you know what a compass is? If you want to draw a circle, it's like this thing is like a V and one side has a pencil or a pencil lead and one side has a needle. And you stick it in the paper and you turn it and you get a circle, right? And you take it away and you have more or less a perfect circle. So what is a circle? The definition of a circle is that it is a set of points, a locus of points, which is equidistant from a fixed point. That's a fancy definition, but it is mana jama. It is absolutely intensive and extensive in delimiting what it is from what it is not. So the center of the circle determines all of the points there. If the center is gone, there is no circle. Is the center on the circumference? No. But it determines every single one of those points. Allah's ma'iyya or His being with you, wa huwa ma'akum ma kuntum, His withness, as it were, with each and every one of us, is of this kind. It is the withness, so to speak, the presence of the nukta tu da'ira, the center of the circle, on the muhit tu da'ira, on the circumference. You can even put that in three dimensions and think of a sphere, but I think I've made the point. So that is one way as a symbol for you to understand how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present and literally determines each and everything, but we can't see Him. Even in geometry, strictly speaking, you should not see the point. But we have to make a representation. And so even though it's really small, but if you think in the abstract, in your mind, in the world of ideas, in the world of ma'qulat, in the world of intelligibles, then you can understand the ideal form of the circle and the ideal form of the point. And these are very profound symbols. And indeed, the study of geometry in ancient times was as a kind of irfani or Gnostic preparation for higher truths. And there is evidence for that, but that is a scholarly subject which is not meant for this audience at this time. So, uh, There is a question that's come up. Uh -huh. uh, the question is... Uh -huh. Namaz is shab, you said it's a requirement. I'm not saying it's a requirement. No, Allah didn't make it a requirement. What I'm saying is that all of the people who have been involved in spiritual culture, for want of a better term, right. in Islamic history, from the beginning until now, Sunni, Shi'i, Shafi, Wafi, Mafi, everybody, so <laughs> has said uh, that you've got to do it. There is so a it, is a, it is a necessary and sufficient condition for the spiritual path. So the question is, is that where does the differentiation come in where we know that the killers of Imam Hussein were also very they're always practicing uh, mm -hmm. namaz al shab as well so what's the differenti differentiation I don't know how widespread the practice of namaz al shab was there maybe it you know, is attested in various sources let's say I concede for the sake of this discussion that, uh, that everybody in the army of Yazid alayhi wa alayhum al-la'na ila abad al-abideen uh, was performing Salat al shab so Namaz al shab So I'll accept that for the purposes of this discussion. They weren't, they didn't do it. They really didn't do it. Because the outward action is just a mold, so to speak. It is a qalib in Arabic we would say. And there is no muhtawa. There is no substantive content to their action. Yani they are frauds. They're like complete and total hypocrites and frauds of the, of, of the, of the first rank. <laughs> so that points to the idea that the ultimate criterion is an internal one. It's not just an outward sort of fulfilling the rules. 
And that, forget, it, that, that applies even to the regular namaz, not just namaz ishab. If you come here to do your dhuhr prayer, for example, but your mind is still on the song you were listening to driving over here in the car, or whatever you were doing before, or you're occupied with, you know, oh God, I've got a final, and, then, and you, you go through four rakahs of the prayer, but you've actually just been preparing for your calculus final the whole time. That's a problem, right? So, so yeah, you've done it, but you've not really done it. And that's the struggle. But in the case of Yazid, that's like to the nth degree. Uh, I mean, that's the, the nth degree of sort of, 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 of spiritual myopia and just complete and utter madness. Okay. Yeah, so uh, what is new? I mean, hi hi hypocrisy is a, is a widespread feature of, the, of human existence. Yeah. Sheikh, there's a young man there. <laughs> Trying to understand the uh, value and the validity of using this philosophical approach. Uh, the Quran and Ahl Bayt are infallible sources and using the Quran to understand the Quran and the Ahl Bayt and Islam which are mm -hmm. infallible to understand the infallible Quran mm -hmm. gives us a, uh, val like a, a certain approach that mm -hmm. we, should we can implement into our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, from my understanding, the scholars that are using the ayat of the Quran and the Ahl Bayt, uh, the, the, uh, the hadith, mm -hmm. they're using opinions. If, if, uh, is that not the case? And if so, uh, how can we be certain their approach is the correct approach and what ha they have come to the conclusion of is the proper conclusion in terms of the practices that been they've been implementing for these years? Who, who are you talking about? I, I'm not sure I understand. The, the scholars are using opinions, which... No, not, uh, not opinions, but like... Uh, whatever you said you used the word opinion, so I, I have to hold to you what you I, said. Okay, so I, what I'm trying to say yeah. is uh, their approach would be fallible mm -hmm. uh, and not infallible in deriving conclusions and extrapolations from the Quran and the Hadith. Mm -hmm. So how can we know that their understandings, rather than opinions, uh, the, um, are, are correct? The understandings of some of the individuals I mentioned in my talk, is that correct. what you mean? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, they obviously are not just talking in a vacuum. The, these are their elaborations and, and uh, interpretations. And you can take them or you can leave them. But, and if you decide to leave them, then unless you yourself are extremely learned and know the languages and so forth and you come to your own conclusion, you're probably going to be following somebody or following uh, someone's approach whom you, you think is maybe better. Well, there you're in the same position. The same question then arises, how do you know about their approach? And my only answer to you, my further answer to you is that this religion is for all kinds of human beings. You have people who are very simple in terms of that they are, do not have an inclination towards profound metaphysical investigations, and that's fine. And they will find what they need to find. And then there are those who seek a very, very profound and deeper understanding of things. And their contemplation has taken them in this direction. You don't have to agree with what I said. No one really does. And I think that there are differences of opinion in our tradition, and that's also fine. But I think what you need to appreciate is that any text which you look at, even if it's the text of the Qur'an or the Hadith, it's in words. And words have any number of meanings and implications and there's a whole area of study in logic and then also in usul al-fiqh. In logic it's called tasawrat or the study of the first act of the mind which is the formation of concepts. And we, we form concepts in the abstract and then they're expressed in this language or that language. And so it's very important to study that. And then also, in the source methodology of Islamic law, or the philosophy of Islamic law, which is called usul al-fiqh, there is a massive section, especially in the Shia world, devoted to what in the Shia nomenclature of, of that subject is called mabahith al-alfaz, which just means linguistic investigations. And so where do the differences come in between 
marja taqlid X and marja taqlid Y because everybody's risala tawzih al-masail is not the same. And none of those individuals, no matter how learned they are, are infallible. And so they have a difference of opinion. Where's the difference of opinion coming? It comes in almost always on the interpretation of a word or a verse from the Quran or a hadith or some discussion about the authenticity of a hadith. So everybody is in that situation. We're all in the same boat, so to speak, to use an Americanism, a vernacular expression. So that's the answer I can give you. And if you're really interested, go and seek out different people, talk to them, ask them. But what I think we need to acknowledge as a tradition, and I think this is very important because you know, among religious communities, even if Shia, Sunni, and, and other religions as well, there is a tendency, but particularly in our community, toward hero worship, personality cults, and you know, my guy is better than your guy, and you guys are wrong. I don't really accept this approach. Even, I, even, I mean, there's even a very important Sunni scholars that you have to read, like Fakhruddin al-Razi. You can't say that Fakhruddin al-Razi is, you know, an X, Y, or Z and use insults or make fun of him and resort to what's called argumentum ad hominem when you attack the person. But that's very common in our tradition. So we need to realize in our own tradition that all right, so Mullah Sadra has written things, Wahid Bahbahani has written things, so and so has written things, you know, and we have to acknowledge that there is a possibility that they might be right about something and we could be wrong because it comes down again on interpretation of words and terms and it's not really for me to impute ill intention, especially to people who died centuries ago who I can never meet, I can only experience through their writing. And so there is a n dire need in our community for some sort of sense of, of, of uh, 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 what's called adab al-ikhtilaf in Arabic or the etiquette of difference of opinion. So I have differences of opinion with a lot of people. Um, you know, I'm not going to name any names, that's not appropriate, you know, prominent in individuals in the Shia community. But I talked to every one of them. I haven't dissed any of them in public. If someone says something which I don't agree with and I know them, I'll call them and say, hey man, you know, you said this, what were you trying to, what was your point? I, I, I need to understand. And they'll explain their position, I'll explain my position, and we remain friends. You have to recognize that I think that as a Shia community, our affection and love really for our fellow Shia people should be non-negotiable and then we can agree to disagree on certain things so you know I can understand why you're asking this question what you know but I have studied these works I you know feel convinced to a great degree on their interpretation and I recognize that there are people who don't like Mullah Sadra who didn't agree with Mullah Sadra historically and today as well and I say, you know, mashallah, fine, that's your opinion. Uh, let's agree to disagree. That's it. But I'm not going to say you're not a proper Shia Muslim. You see, that, that's where it becomes problematic, where they say, you know, these are all, they're deviants and so forth, and, you know, if you shake hand with the person, then your hand is najis. And this is, stuff has happened in Islamic history. It happened. We need to move away from that. Hassan Sheikh, I'm just paying attention to time. Uh, inshallah, in my... Secretary who runs a tight ship has already told me, <laughs> I said, well, let's go. Okay, I said, I told him, no problem. We got about five to ten minutes. Uh -huh. So I know there's three more brothers here. I don't know if we have any more sisters with questions, but maybe I'll take one more on the other side as well. So with that said, uh, brother, we're going to go with Brother Arif, followed by Brother Ali, and then uh, I'm going to say our young man over there. Not our has, has so three questions. Are you sure that the sisters have been given a chance? Yes. Also, also uh, please be sure. Uh, that uh, by the way, are there any questions on the sisters' side before I uh, move forward with our gentleman here? Yeah, it's important. Any questions they from they our sisters' side, please? Hmm. Give them a chance. No, no, uh, Amir. Okay. No. So, Brother Arif, the father. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum assalam. It was a very uh, uh, thought-provoking lecture. Thank you very much for that. Um, I just have a two-part question. The one, the first one would be um, when you mentioned about the angels um, asking Allah, why would you create a being that would cause bloodshed, etc. Mm -hmm. um, did they have foresight of that or did they know about a, a, a prior being that was here before Adam? Uh, and if so, then, then what would that be? You know, we know about uh, the fossils, etc., you know, dinosaurs and all that before, but how does that kind of fall into place? 
uh, being yeah. that this Earth is 6.5 <coughs> billion years old, etc. That's my first question. Second would mm -hmm. be, um, how would you convince a person, uh, just a layman, or maybe you know, Ahlul Kitab, that Islam is the final religion, uh, oh boy. <laughs> based on yeah, based on the 3,000, you know, obviously from Hinduism, etc. That that you know, 3,000 what? 2,000 years ago, where Hinduism oh. was, you know, was established, and then we have this root of religion from there on. All right, first, your first question addresses the interpretation of that verse. There's, there's numerous interpretations. If you go in the tafsir literature, yes, they might talk about this. I have no, nothing to say about fossils and this, that and the other, as you mentioned it. Um, but m more than likely, the, 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 those people who have that interpretation, to the best of my knowledge, they have like maybe have in mind the jinn, for example. Um, but other, other beyond that, I really don't know. I think we have to be honest and say, I, I don't know. I have not investigated the whole full range of uh, uh, interpretations on that, uh, on that ayah. Uh, the, the next question is, how do you convince a Christian or a Jew, right? You said a Christian or a Jew of the truth of Islam. Well, that's, that's a big, um, big debate, big question. And when you say a Christian or a Jew, that, it's very general because there, there are Christians and there are Christians. There are many different types of Christians. And if you go with sort of the official versions of Christianity, you've got Catholics, you've got the Orthodox, and you have the Protestants. And with, among them, they have all sorts of divisions as well. And in America, many people identify as all sorts of things. <laughs> And sometimes they identify as Christian. They don't do anything which really seems Christian. So it, it's very hard to give a general sort of answer. And the same applies for Jews. There's all sorts of Jews, different groups among the Jews, right? There's the Orthodox Jews. The Orthodox split into the Mitnagdim and the Hasidim. And then you've got your conservative Jews and your Reform Jews and Reconstructionist Jews. And you've just got all sorts of Jews. Um, just like there's a vast ver variety among Muslims. So it all comes down to who, who is the person you're talking to. But generally speaking, it's, a, it's very hard for me to give a general answer. And I don't know how you brought in Hinduism, and I'm not really sure what you meant by that, but um, that's a whole other discussion as well. And oftentimes, in the case, let's say, generally speaking, of Christianity and Judaism, it's not a question of theism, as it would be with an atheist, because they already believe in Allah in some sense. And they say the devil is in the details, because with the Christians, it's a huge problem. You know, do they really have the same doctrine of Allah as we do? And the answer is no. So oftentimes with Christians of any of these three varieties, it comes down to a debate because the Christians will say that the entire Christian revelation is built upon the death, the life, death, and resurrection. You know, the, life, the death, crucifixion, and res resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Christ is seen as this sacrifice of a God-man vicarious sacrifice for the sins of humanity. Well, that's something which we have to dispute. And you can dispute that on logical grounds because according to the Christian doctrine, which was officially instituted in the year 325 of their calendar in, at the Council of Nicaea, Jesus is fully God and fully man. And God is three persons of a trinity which are co-equal and co-eternal. Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox all believe that. This is a logical contradiction. It makes no sense whatsoever. Because Jesus is fully God and fully man, and he's crucified on the cross. So did they kill God, but then he's resurrected. And if he's the son of God, then where was his father? You know, did they overcome God? God couldn't save him. I mean, there's all sorts of logical problems that come in, and they reject all of those. And they'll say, no, it's not something which can be understood rationally. Well, then there's no discussion then. It becomes fideism or mere blind faith. And they all have this problem. Even someone who's very logical, like Thomas Aquinas, who is really quite brilliant in many areas, and his, his famous, very famous proof for the existence of God is really just pretty much taken from Ibn Sina because Ibn Sina, a Shi'i scholar, 12 or Shi'i scholar uh, in, in my view, was, uh, was translated into Latin. And then when he comes up against the Trinity, he says, well here, you know, and he even proves that Allah is utterly simple. He is basit. He is absolutely one. He is yakta, yagana. He is unique. And then he says, but you know, we have to have the Trinity. And there he dispenses with reason. He says, here we accept scripture. Which scripture is he accepting? He's accepting the, the so-called New Testament the four Gospels 
and other writings, which are all in Greek, a language which Jesus never spoke. So then the debate goes to the authenticity of those sources with the Christian. You say, this doesn't make any sense. Jesus didn't even speak Greek. Can you kindly explain that? Then he has to come back with something. Then you have to come back with something. And then if you really go into it, you'll find out that these four Gospels don't agree. There's all sorts of contradictions. They don't have an oral tradition like we do of the Quran. There's something like 250,000 manuscript variants. I mean, that's insane. That's more than there are words in the New Testament. It's either 250 or 125,000. I mean, it's, it's like Sabah lakh, Dai lakh, Ya Rabbi, Baud Zadai. That's a lot. You know, 150,000. Uh, so, you would have to then talk about the authenticity of the books. And so there's logical problems, there's authenticity problems, <coughs> and Really, I don't, I don't think that, that there's a rational defense on the Christian side, but it's not that simple. You know, it's, it's, it's what's here. I, 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 I think that the rationality of Christianity is, is extremely tenuous. If you actually talk about the doctrines. And mind you, I don't want to say that, and I don't want to any, uh, offend, but if you, if you actually get involved in a respectful dialogue, you have, to, you have to say things as they are. You have to say, look, this doesn't make sense. And ultimately, when it comes down to those doctrines, there's also original sin, it all comes down to fideism, just that kind of blind faith on those doctrines. In the case of the Jews, the Jews are a huge problem because um, they have certain claims which they make. And if they're religious Jews, then they think that the whole thing is done with Moses, alayhi salam, right? <clears throat> and so they think that the Torah, and the, 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 as it was revealed, is absolutely complete and there can't be any other religion that comes after. And so then you have to ask them, well, if that's true, then what were the Jews doing in Medina? And then they will attack your sources. And they'll say, well, you know, Jews have always been waiting for a Messiah. And you say, well, they weren't waiting for a Messiah. The books in the Arab historical tradition say they were waiting for a Nabi. Then they might dispute that. Then you have to come at them with Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Because in that verse, it clearly says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise a prophet from among your brethren. And the brethren is very clear who the brethren are. The brethren are, are those who descend through Ismail. All right, and it says that he will, and I will put my words in his mouth. That's the wahi. And I will hold those people to account. So there is a long tradition in Judaism, and that's represented in the Arabic historical sources that they were waiting for a Nabi, and then we know what happened after that. That's even there in the Sunni sources, the seerah of Ibn Hisaq, Ishaq, and the recension of Ibn Hisham. It's well known, all of the intrigues and so forth that took place. And uh, also you can talk about the, uh, the mess, the, the literal mess which the Old Testament is in. It's not like the Qur'an. They don't memorize this book. It's a manuscript tradition for them. And there are problems with manuscripts. There are different versions of the Torah. Many Muslims don't know that there is something called the Samaritan Pentateuch or the Samaritan Torah. And there's a group called the Samaritans in, in Palestine. In Hebrew they're known as the Shomronim. And they're not considered to be Jews because they have a different Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible of the Jews. It's completely different. There are 6,000 variants. 6,000 differences. Whether they're mine or not, it's still a big deal. And this is an acknowledged fact by s linguists and scholars of the Hebrew language. It's not something that's disputed. If you read the Old Testament itself, there are pl plenty of places that make no sense at all. So it's made very clear that a covenant or an ahad, a mithaq is entered into with Ibrahim alayhi salam and his progeny. And the sign of this mithaq, ajalakum Allah, is the circumcision. And it says that Ibrahim alayhi salam underwent this, as did all of the male members of his house. Household means his, his khadam, his, his servants, everybody. As did his son at the time. There was no other son but Ismail. It is a known fact in the Old Testament. Uh, Old Testament is what the Christians call it because it's old for them. Jews don't use that. They'll say the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, in Genesis. Uh, it's very clear that when Ishaq salam, was born, Ismail was already 13 years old. So you have to directly ask them uh, by what canon of logic is Ismail out of the covenant? Because for them, the covenant is basically a real estate deal. And we know where that is all played out in modern history. And if you actually ask them that, if you actually confront, I've never been able to do this in public, but I did this once with a Jewish student who was also a rabbi at Princeton. I'm not going to name him, he's still out there. And I directly asked him this, and we were sitting in my dorm room, and I showed him the text, and he sort of went this way and that way, and sort of tried to dodge the question. I said, no, you, you've got a, 
you don't have, what is the evidence? And don't cite me the Talmud or something, tell me, because that's another thing, the rulings of rabbis. How do you explain this Nas, this text? Because this is Nas on Sariha, it's an explicit text. It's not some, you know, poetic thing. There's no figurative usage, there's no sort of linguistic games you can play. So he just got angry after a while, he said, it doesn't matter. The covenant is with Isaac and that's the end of it, and that was the end of the discussion, he left. So that position is also unassailable. But these are difficult discussions to have with people, but that's how you would have to go about it. That's a sketch of some of the issues. I hope that is um, some manner of an answer. So, <coughs> I have a question on a personal spirituality perspective. Mm -hmm. um, previously, one of the brothers asked a question, and I think you also touched upon the answer of, you know, so a lot of times we know we look upon prayer as a chore. Um, like, oh, I have to pray, or let me just mm -hmm. get over with it, or something yep, like that. Yep. And, you know, to an extent, I'm even ashamed to admit that I've been there. I think we've many, all been there. There's many no times, shame right? there. Yeah. But, you know, one quote really comes to mind mm. is Marhum Mullah Azgar, um, who, and I'm paraphrasing, who said that, you know, I don't pray to go worship him, but I, I rush to prayer because I am so thankful that he gave me one more opportunity to, mm. you know, um, to worship him. And, you know, I have That's seen beautiful. individuals who have found that connection where they want to, when it's times for prayer, they want to do nothing but pray and mm. just be submissive in devotion. And when I see that, I clearly see that they have something I don't. Clearly. Whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual, whatever it is. And I honestly don't know how to even find that path. Because I don't know how to create that connection when I see someone who has it. And I know it. He has something that I don't have. How do I even strive towards that? Again, you can't make that an impossibility. You're already making an impossibility for yourself. You're saying, how can I do that? You can, Baba. You must try. And you must keep trying. And like I said, you turn to Allah and you ask Him to aid you in that struggle, in that endeavor. And you need to stick with it. Because as long as you stick with it, you know, see, if you're doing your namaz continuously, even though if you're saying, oh, but you're doing it, Allah is enabling you to do it. It's having some benefit. And if you think, now forget it, I'm not doing it, that's the weapon of the enemy. You think, you know, my namaz is no good, my mind is wandering. I have said that, these are problems, but you don't leave it. Because it's Allah in the end that is giving you the tawfiq to bring you back there every time. And you think, it, you know, I'm just failing at this every time. And you know, you may be falling short, but you really don't know. Because in the end, you know, Allah knows really your struggle. No one else really does, even people very close to you. And if you truly are striving with the right intention, He will reward you accordingly. You must remember Allah is just. And with that in view, you have to keep at it. What you can't do is give in to a failure mindset, a desperation mindset. It's like, thing like oh, you know, I don't want to do this because that's what the, the enemy is leading you toward. The shaitan is leading you in this direction. Like, you know, I'm just going to blow this off. This is just not going anywhere. I've been doing this. No, it's Allah who's bringing you back every day and allowing you the opportunity. And mashallah, that was a beautiful quotation you, you, you quoted from Marhum Mullah Azhar. That is it. You know, he, he's bringing you back. So show some thanks. Instead of thinking, gosh, this is a chore. It's like, you know, I'm really tired. It's Fajr time. I really want to go back to bed. But at least I got up and I made wudu. In, you know, it's, and it's 20 degrees outside and the bathroom was freezing. And it takes too long for the hot water to come. So I just like go through it really well. And I'm freezing here, shaking. But you're there. You did it. So say Alhamdulillah and keep going. Last question. Here, one last question. Uh, I was wondering 
that 95 percent of the world which is not Shia is going into Jahannam because they are not doing their namazes and they are not doing uh, 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 they are not following Alibad, mm. uh, uh, how they live and what they do mm -hmm. so you were just speaking about different religions different uh, kinds of books and different uh, that means Allah has created everyone 95 percent of the people as non Shias are they going to Jahannam why should they go to Jahannam I want that answer which has not been given all along except that you have said that only Shias who do 100 namazes and 200 uh, that duas <laughs> and, and all that yeah. they alone will uh, get the best houses in the ja Jannah uh, so uh, but Allah says in Quran it says mm. Rasul tell them those who are in majority with you that those who do good deeds are nearer to me even though they are not Shias Well, thank you. That's a very uh, good question, very thought-provoking. Um, I would like to say by clarification that I've made uh, no such claim that the Shias who don't pray 200 or however you phrased it or however I said it are not going to Jannah. Uh, as regarding other religions and, um, you know, Sunni Muslims, again, I made no such statement in that regard, but generally speaking in Islamic theology, the ulama of this science speak in general terms. They speak in general terms and they speak in conditional terms. They say, if you do this, if you are a Nasabi, if you are this. But I can't say, with some rare exceptions, that you know this individual Christian is going to hell right now. I don't know, tomorrow, God forbid, he may become a great Shia Muslim, the other person might die as a Jew or a Christian or a Hindu or a Zoroastrian or what have you. Uh, so you, you, have, uh, you have to be very careful about making those kind of pronouncements. And in the final analysis, neither you nor I will be the judge on that day. Allah is the judge. We have our theological positions. I do think that if someone believes and commits shirk that they're going to hell. But I cannot say for my you know, Christian colleague at university that that's what's going to happen to him. You know, maybe he will change, something will happen. I, I really don't know for sure. I really don't. But I can say that in generally speaking, this is what will happen to you. you know, I think it's much better if you change your belief. But lakum dinukum And Allah will judge that person according to everything they did in the grand scheme of things and in, in such detail that, that no one else could really fathom except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I um, um, avoid those kind of um, vast sort of sweeping uh, uh, kind of statements that oh you know oh, everybody who's not a Muslim is going to hell <laughs> it's more nuanced and more complicated than that Asan Sheikh and we were going to end the program but I could just not say no to one individual which is our very first president of our community sure. Ali Kalfan who does amazing work by the way Sheikh just the kind of work he does yes mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing so with that I'm going to have him ask our very last question very well. for the night yeah uh, Assalamu alaikum brother Wa alaikum assalam in the Quran, there is a verse which says, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. On the day of judgment, our Prophet is going to complain to Allah, we have abandoned the Quran. Mm -hmm. Please explain why, why there is a verse of Quran which says that we have abandoned the Quran. Our Prophet will complain to Allah. <laughs> Can you explain? Hmm. Well, that's I. Yeah, I don't think I can. No, <laughs> I don't think I can explain that. Uh, I, at, at this point, I don't really. Uh, you know, I. I mean, I could venture some sort of an answer, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I mean, I would have to go and look in the tafsir literature and so forth. And I, I think one has to be responsible in these kind of situations. I don't want to just come up with something off the top of my head and say it. Forgive me. Uh huh. 
So three will be just be No, we are all we are all born Muslims. Everybody is born a Muslim. Come to that from the If everybody is born a Muslim, and then you choose or your family chooses which way to go. Mm-hmm. We can't put the buck on Allah that you created me as a Jew. Why why are you sending me to hell? That's what I'm understanding. Right, well, anyway, there's a lot of things that could be said, but I think that I've also uh, reached the end of my own capacity at this point. So please, thank you very much. It was really an honor uh, to address you all, and um, I'm really grateful for everyone who arranged this and made this possible, President of, the, of your society, Hassan Aziz. Uh, thank you again, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Bilal Hussein, and of course, uh, Mr. Mohsen Megji. Thank you very much for facilitating this, and it really was a, a great honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. May Allah reward you all abundantly. Salawat. Sheikh Nizam Ahmad, Brother Hussein, who have been visiting us, all both of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and your families for the amazing work you do. And I have to tell you, Sheikh Nizam, Sheikh Nizam, I have to tell you one thing. We have had a lot of speakers who visited us, but wallahi, I'd be lying to you. The kind of impression you made here this evening with us, the fact that you spent all this time and you took every single question with grace, and the knowledge you exhibited in the process just shows us that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless you. May He give you the continued ma'rifah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pave the way for you to keep on serving the ummah the way you've already been doing. With that, may we give Him a loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alima. With that said, Sheikh Bilal, today I've never heard you recite ziyarah for us. So today I'm going to put you on the spot and I'm going to ask you to bless us but only one condition brother Ahmad told me please don't make it long like brother uh, Ibrahim Isa for Muhammad wa ala Muhammad salawat mutawajjih ziyara Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad bismillahir rahmanir rahim السلام عليك يا رسول الله السلام عليك يا نبي الله السلام عليك يا حبيب الله وخاتم النبيين السلام عليك أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب السلام عليك فاطمة الزهراء سيدة النساء العالمين السلام عليك يا حسن بن علي المجتبى السلام عليك يا أبو عبد الله الحسين الشهيد بكربلاء السلام عليكم يا تسعة المعصومين من ذرية الحسين علي بن الحسين زين العابدين ومحمد بن علي باقر وعلم النبيين وجعفر بن محمد الصادق وموسى بن جعفر الكاظم وعلي بن موسى الرضا ومحمد بن علي الجواد وعلي بن محمد الهادي والحسن بن علي الأسكري السلام عليك يا حجة الله يا ابن الحسن يا صاحب العصر والزمان عجل الله تعالى فرجك وسهن الله تعالى مخرجك وظهورك وجعلنا من عوانك والأنصارك السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته الله